All right, I guess it's time to get started. Um, so I'm Yannick Seeley. I'm going to be talking about uh, native code and off-heap data structures and some other stuff, too. Um, you know, the, the contents of my uh, talk sort of uh, doesn't completely reflect my abstract because that was written long ago and certain things didn't happen the way I wanted them to, so we'll get into that. But, um, so first, a little bit about me. Um, Way back in 2004 now, uh, I created Solar while at CNET Networks. So in a way, this is like Solar's uh, 10th anniversary. So you can buy it a beer later. Um, and then like way back again in 2007, I helped start uh, LucidWorks, formerly Lucid Imagination. And then uh, just at the end of last year, I started a new company called HelioSearch. So just a, a little bit about heliosearch.com, since it is a new company. It's, you know, pretty much your standard, uh, you know, we do everything around solar, um, you know, services, support. Um, of course, you know, some of my favorite stuff is uh, the custom engineering. When you get a customer that wants uh, some improvement in solar or heliosearch, and, you know, they pay us money for that, and it's a big win-win. Um, so the other little thing we have is uh, HDS. Helio search distribution for solar. And all this really is, is it's uh, pretty much just stock Apache solar, and then we've added a server directory. That's a Tomcat distribution, you know, because you, you see it on the user list all the time. People want to get started with Tomcat for some reason. They want to use Tomcat with solar, and solar um, by default uh, uh, bundles with Jetty. And so um, this has like Tomcat all configured the correct way, has logging and stuff set up, has start and stop scripts. It even takes like Jetty command line parameters. So if you're using Tomcat, you can sort of follow along with documentation that assumes that you're using Jetty. So now the Helio Search project, which is different than the Helio Search company. The, the Helio Search company is actually named after the Helio Search project, I guess, because I conceived of this first. Um, anyway. It's designed to be the next evolution of solar. Um, we're incubating it at uh, GitHub. It was just started in the middle of January. And, um, you know, sort of the idea is, you know, what big things do we want to do next for solar? And we thought it would be easiest um, to sort of do that outside the ASF at GitHub uh, to really enable us to move uh, rapidly and make some big changes. So. Uh, the overall goal, though, is to bring it back to Apache at some point when it's got its legs under it. And uh, so, you know, we're following all the Apache IP rules and everything like that. It is currently a drop-in replacement for solar at the HTTP API level, um, just, you know, trying to get some more users and stuff like that, so we want to maintain uh, backward compatibility, at least at the HTTP API level. It's already very different underneath the covers in certain ways. Uh, the current features are uh, off-heap filters, off-heap field cache, and uh, facet by function. Um, I'm sort of staying away from any changes in the solar cloud distributed indexing side of things right now because it's evolving so rapidly in solar. I don't want to touch that stuff in HelioSearch. You know, we're sort of like merging changes in from solar all the time to uh, maintain it as a uh, superset. So garbage collection, the scourge that is garbage collection. Uh, some very basic uh, garbage collection things. It's, it's, uh, it's very useful to understand the basics. I am not a garbage collection expert. If you want to ask questions about garbage collection later, I'd suggest someone like uh, Mark, or, and I'm sure like a lot of other in the room are like more um, garbage collector uh, uh, experts than I am, you know, with all the tuning and stuff. I really don't get into that that much. But the basics are very useful to understand uh, how Mark and Sweep gar garbage collection works. You essentially start at the roots, at GC roots, and those could be like threads and uh, uh, local variables on the thread, uh, on the stack, and uh, you know, uh, statics, anything else that you know are live, and you sort of just trace references and see what objects you can reach. And in this diagram, you know, the objects you can reach are in white, and if you can't reach the object anymore, that means it's garbage. And so um, how Java does things is it you know, divides up the heap, and it always creates new objects in Eden space. And so then when it time to do, comes time to do a garbage collection, it finds which objects are live and simply copies them somewhere else. And then everything that's left over is garbage, and you can reuse that whole space. 
Now to copy these live objects, you can think about just sort of like plugging them in into the survivor space in holes and stuff, right? But that, you know, that gets hard, you know, it's like uh, it's fragmentation and stuff. And so how Oracle hotspot uh, garbage collectors normally work is they um, copy, in addition to the Eden space, they also take an existing survivor space and copy it to another survivor space. So they sort of uh, collect both at once and things move back and forth amongst the survivor spaces. And then when something is like old enough and it's moved a couple times uh, throughout the survivor spaces, it gets moved to tenured space that's collected less often with the idea that if something's been around a while, well, you know, maybe it's gonna like hang around even longer and you know, that's the idea at least. Uh, stop the world pauses are needed when garbage collectors can't keep up. It varies by garbage collector, you know, when that happens, but all garbage collectors um, that, that Oracle have, at least, they all have this stop the world uh, phase to them, just some worse than others. So the memory impact of garbage collection. Um, one thing you see a lot of is people buy these really big boxes and then they stick a whole bunch of JVMs on them. Um, this isn't the best for, I mean, it's, it's what they have to do, but it's just sort of like it's, Java was not designed the best for this because it's not good at sharing resources. Um, first of all, you have to configure the max heap high enough so that uh, you don't run into out of memory issues, right? One of the problems with Java, though, is it doesn't give memory back that easily or as easily as you would like to the operating system for, for other uh, JVMs to share. Um, so, you know, we have our heap in use, and then we have all this unused heap um, that's, you know, this is up here, all this memory belongs to the process, um, but all this is like garbage or extra accounting space for the uh, garbage collector, stuff like that, right? Um, and so you just end up wasting a lot of memory when you have multiple JVMs on a big machine. Um, in contrast, we have our C model in green, and uh, it works a bit differently by default. Um, there's a heap in C, too, and it's actually, in some respects, it's worse than the heap in Java, because Java can move things around and compact it over time, right? The C heap can get fragmented, but there's a secret weapon, and it's like, you know, at least in Linux, in glibc, by default, if you malloc something greater than 128K by default, it doesn't go on the C heap. glibc asks the operating system, you know, to, to give that chunk of memory via mmap. Does, I think it's like a, a private anonymous mmap. Private meaning it's not shared with any other processes. Anonymous meaning it's, you know, you're memory mapping something, but it's not a file. You're just memory mapping nothing. And so it's like memory out of thin air. Um, and so this is really notable because now the operating system is more involved in managing the memory. The good part to that is when you go and call free on one of these big pieces of memory that's like those, these little uh, green slices here, when you go call free on that, then the operating system knows that it's, it's free immediately and it can use it to do, you know, it can use it to uh, fulfill a memory allocation request from another process or it can use it to uh, buffer the contents of your index files, which is important for fast search. So um, now to the, uh, the CPU impact of garbage collection. It's like, of course, all the work that the garbage collector does, that's less time that your, you know, your application has to do its work. It's a zero-sum game in a way. Um, so. Uh, and then you get into the stop the world pauses, which is really the worst part about garbage collection. Uh, well, it's one of the worst parts, and a lot of work has gone into reducing how long these stop the world garbage collection pauses hit, because they can be seconds, they can be minutes. I've seen like some customers complain up, you know, like 10 minute pauses, and these are when I say stop the world, all threads stop. The process essentially looks dead to the outside world. Um, and they tend to be proportional to heap size. So it's, again, it's the customers with the, this huge hardware and they throw these JVMs on there with tons of heap. They have huge garbage collection pauses. So um, it's interesting too what impact that can have on solar cloud. 
like the solar cloud has these, uh, you know, zookeeper sessions open to, uh, to sort of monitor liveness of the nodes, right? And so when you hit a huge garbage collection pause, if it's big enough, it can, you know, cause solar cloud to think that node is down. And so then it gets marked down. When it comes back, it has to, like, you know, do this extra recovery work. Essentially, it can make a bad situation into a worse situation because it's just causing more activity to have to happen. Um, another big thing in general what I've seen is like there's a, like I said, there's a lot of work that's gone into reducing the max pause sizes. Unfortunately, what I've seen is this normally results in reducing total aggregate throughput. And the reason is one way they reduce the uh, max pause is they just do, try to do more work ahead of time. And a lot of that work is just wasted effort. It's like, you know, if you cleaned your room ten times a day instead of one time a day. You know, it would be, it was just, it's just more work. Um, so one way uh, to try to solve some of these GC problems, GC tuning. Like I said, I am not a GC tuning expert, but I did find uh, this whole list of all these uh, um, command line parameters to the JVM that have to do with memory and garbage collection. Uh, there are a lot of them. So. It feels like, I mean, garbage collection is supposed to make our lives easier. And it has made life easier for certain, you know, certain types of people, like developers and stuff, the people that actually write the code. Oh, I don't have to track anything, right? But it seems like sometimes it's pushed off a problem onto people that have to deploy the software that's written. Um, and so another problem here is that this problem is not does not get solved in a scalable way through GC tuning. And when I say scalable, I mean we can't solve this problem once and then just have it solved for everybody. Everybody has to figure out what parameters work well for them. You know, they can try to take somebody else's parameters as a starting point, but at the end of the day, they have to figure out what works well with their, you know, the way they're using the index. Um, so that sort of sucks that everybody has to do this. So it would be nice if we could just like try to solve it more at the code side, produce less garbage, do something so that the garbage collection, you know, the garbage collector isn't such a bottleneck or it's not so important. So um, one thing we can do is reuse objects to just try to create less garbage. Um, that can only get us so far. The other thing we can do is move things off heap and say, okay, for a certain class of memory, we know we can do a better job of managing it than the garbage collector. And so no, option number one for that, direct byte buffers. So the problem with direct byte buffers, one problem is that it's sort of like inherently 32-bit for some reason. It's like all the indexes and stuff that you're given are like, uh, are, are ints. Um, and so we can only go up to like two gigabytes. Another problem is that there's no, you know, supported way to actually uh, call free. Uh, it relies on the garbage collector again um, to sort of free the memory when the object, you know, when it knows that the object is unreachable. And so I'd like a way to like, you know, more like call free and have it really immediately free and not have to rely on the garbage collector. So option two is what HelioSearch uses is uh, it relies on sun misc unsafe. And, uh, and that essentially gives you malloc free direct memory access. You can do whatever you want. Um, now, some people will be like, oh, you can't do that. You know, it's not a supported Java, blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't care. Um, it's, it's in all the supported, uh, in all the major JVMs that we care about. Um, and it's widely used in uh, both the JDK as well as a lot of other open source packages. So it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, it's also being considered for Java 9, as I understand it. Um, you know, it's because it is so important to so many people that are trying to do high-performance computing, um, they're actually considering having it publicly supported in Java 9. Now, I imagine they would, like, you know, change the name from Sun to something else, and they'd probably stop calling it unsafe because that just sounds bad. Uh, but, I, you know, I expect the, uh, this type of interface or the ability to do this type of stuff is not going to go away. So the first thing I moved off heap were um, filters the, um, in the, in the uh, solar filter cache. And uh, so I set out 
with solar to try to like duplicate some of the GC problems that uh, people were having. And I thought it was going to be hard, but I actually got it on my first try. So I didn't even bother trying something else. I, d I made a guess at some parameters that might, it might start to stress memory, and sure enough, it did. So this was a uh, 50 million doc index, um, and I was querying with 500 unique filters. These filters matched a lot of documents. So if you do the math, it comes out to about, uh, you know, because they're bit sets, it comes out to a little over three gigabytes of filtered data. Um, I sent in 20,000 uh, 20, requests as the workload. And then, you know, and this is on my box with eight gigabytes of RAM. And then the result here um, on the, the top graph, the red is the maximum heap. The blue is the amount of heap in use. And these gray bars in the middle are uh, the garbage collection uh, events. And the thick gray bars are stop the world pauses. And I could actually see these stop the world pauses when I was running a test, because my, my console would be scrolling, and then I'd like see it just pause for like a little over a second, and scroll, and then pause. And so it was actually visible to the outside world. They were only like, you know, a second, but, you know, like I say, I had a, I had a relatively small heap, just four gigabytes. So when you have like customers that have 40 gigabytes and stuff, you can see how their, their pauses could be much bigger. Um, so at the end of the test, it turned out like, you know, 26 seconds had been spent in garbage collection. So this is like uh, pretty bad. I did not, I'm sure this could be improved via garbage collection tuning, but I already told you I don't know how to do that. So, um, and that's, that's not the point anyway. It's like the point is I don't want to have to, I, I don't want to have to worry about garbage collection uh, tuning. And so this was um, Helio search with uh, off heap filters, same test, and it finished much sooner um, simply because it wasn't spending all of its time in garbage collection. Um, I didn't pass any parameters to that, I just let it pick its max heap. It's interesting, it looks like the max heap's going down over time, so like it's figuring out how to give some uh, memory back to the operating system. It like overestimated at first, I don't know what's up with that. But, uh, you know, the total amount of time was uh, 0.3 seconds spent in garbage collection. So it clearly worked um, when solar was under, um, in, in a bad situation with garbage collection. This is not a normal situation, by the way. Um, you, you can just tell it's like the throughput was far worse. Here's what the numbers came out to be. Um, so it's interesting, all the performance um, increases were due to just getting rid of the outliers. If you looked at the median times, um, they were the same for solar and helio search. It didn't matter that we'd moved things off heap for that. It was only the outliers when we got to 99, 99.9% .9 that, uh, that we got rid of those big pauses. And that resulted, though, in this big uh, um, change in throughput. So I also wanted to see you know, what, what the actual total process size was. And so I did a number of runs. Um, it looked at it, watched it through top, and just sort of observed uh, the maximum values that I saw. Solar, um, it tended to go from 3.8 to 4.3 gigabytes max heap, depending on the run. I guess it just, you know, sometimes it would get luckier and be able to, like, you know, make do with less. It's whatever the garbage collector was trying to do at the time, I guess. Uh, Helio Search was, uh, had a much more stable, it was just very between 3.6 and 3.7 gigabytes. So, I, I, one thing I could do to make the, the solar situation better is obviously just give it more heap, right? Of course, in this particular scenario, I'm not sure how much heap we have left to give. The index itself was 3.8 gigabytes, I think, the index files. Um, so if we gave solar five gigs a heap, it would just, uh, gave it another gigabyte, it might be out of uh, garbage collector trouble but then we're in the situation where we don't have enough free memory left to cache all the index files. And so then our search would get slow for other reasons. So off heap field cache is the next thing that uh, I implemented. Um, basically the field cache um, is used when uninverting uh, index fields into a column so that you can use it to like, you know, do fast sorting, um, fast function queries, uh, faceting, and uh, grouping. Um, 
and it uses weak references, which we don't like because it relies on the garbage collector again. And so what it did is uh, created HelioSearch N cache. The N was for native. And all the allocations are off heap. And it's a first class, um, I call it a first class solar cache. Um, so that you, know, you can, you can uh, configure its size, you can configure its warming policies, you can view statistics through the admin interface, um, and it's per segment too, and so it's like NRT friendly. So if you, know, you have a new view of the index and only one segment changed, then only one segment you need to repopulate in the cache. And of course, you know, we stay away from weak references. So if we go to the admin screen of Helio Search, which looks exactly like solar, plug in stats, uh, go to cache, and then go down to end cache, and you'll sort of see the, the information that you get um, and the, uh, the instantiated field cache, now end cache elements. I'm going to blow that up on the next page so you can actually see it. Um, and so for every uh, field cache element, you know, we get the, you know, what field it is, the number of uses it's had, um, for this searcher only currently. So what you can do, you can send in a request, and then you can look at the uses and, and see which caches were used um, to like, satisfy your request. The number of segments are the number of populated segments. Um, the number of uh, carried over are the number of segments that were carried over from the last view of the index. And so you see, th this actually had uses of zero, num segments five, whereas some of the others have num segment seven. So I think the index at this point actually has seven segments, but this hasn't even been used, so um, it only has five segments populated. In fact, we actually did like a sort by the price field. You'd see a bunch of this stuff change, and the number of segments uh, would go to seven, carried over would stay at five, because we had to generate two new ones when we actually used it. Oh, and the most important thing that people can see now easily is the size, the size and bytes that the actual uh, cache element takes up. So I implemented um, integer field support for end cache first. Um, I tested it with 50 million documents sorting on six different integer fields um, that had various unique number of values in those fields. The results, um, the results were surprising. You know, it's like 42% faster for sorting, 73% faster for uh, function queries. And that was the, f I only tried one function. It was like an add of uh, random integer fields and then sort on that. But it was still um, surprising because this was, I was not testing a scenario where uh, we were garbage collection pressured or something. I did not see a lot of garbage collection uh, going on during this test. So um, a lot of this is just, the performance is just due to um, the new cache uh, implementation, I guess. And I haven't, I haven't really tried to try to split out what's due to what, but it's, you know, hey, it's faster. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. So next, I implemented all the other uh, numeric types along with string fields. And um, for the string fields, I tested sorting on a 10 million document index and it's like, it was really just trying to measure mostly just sorting. So the queries were very lightweight, you know, Q is star, colon, star, and then like sort on, uh, you know, various fields uh, ascending or descending. And so this is what the median latencies looked like. For some reason, solar um, got a little bit slower when uh, the number of unique uh, values increased. That actually makes sense. I don't know why Helio search stayed quite as linear. Um, anyway. This, this counts more as a micro benchmark, not as important. It's uh, benchmarks at this that, that are, that are uh, a little more important um, because it mixes, it tests throughput and it tests a lot of different fields all at once. If you test one field over and over again, Hotspot can over specialize it and you're gonna be testing performance that you're not gonna get in the real world. And so this you know, picked random, um, fields to sort on and sorted on randomly ascending, descending all at once. And overall, we saw a 50% performance gain. So again, a lot better than expected, and I was really excited about that. So native code. I know this is in the title of my talk, um, but I this is my only slide. I'll, I'll get to why later. So th the idea 
is um, if we have big CPU hotspots like faceting, let's turn that in the native code and um, see if we can get a performance increase out of it. But then the next thing you realize when you, when you look into that is that JNI sort of sucks. It, specifically, it sucks at dealing with big arrays. And so you have this big array on the Java heap. Guess what? You can't get to it from native code. And so, you know, you sort of suck. So here, here's some uh, JNI code. It's like you're getting a, um, an int pointer into this Java array. Guess what? That makes a copy. That might be fine for small arrays, but if you have like this gigabyte array that you're working over, that's just, that's just not acceptable. We can't, can't do it. Um, so they also added a get primitive array critical. And that sort of changed things because the contract was, we'll try as hard as we can to give you a pointer to the actual real data without making a copy. The bunch of caveats, though, in that you have to treat it as a critical section. You can't call anything that might block. You can't call any other J and I functions. And you should only um, hold this critical section for a very small amount of time. Part of the reason is the way it's normally implemented is they just stop garbage collectors from working. Um, so that completely, again, defeats the purpose of going to native code in the first place. If it's really small and really fast where I can use this critical section, I don't need to go to native code anyway. It's already fast. Um, the saving thing here is if you have the data off heap, then you can just use it as a pointer. It's already invisible to the garbage collector. And that's really the, the way to deal with large sets of data, being able to like, you know, uh, run native code over them. So I was going to actually implement some of this native code faceting and stuff, but you know, uh, real world uh, intervened and a customer came to us and they wanted um, some additional functionality put into Helio search. Um, and so that's what I worked on. And specifically, one of the things they wanted was facet by function. Normal facets are faceting by document count. And so faceting by function just adds functions um, that you can sort by and aggregate by instead. And so the, the functions that we have, we have count, which is what we had before, but we also have um, sum, average, sum squared, min, and max. All these guys are of an arbitrary function. So you can do it of a field, but you can also do it over like, you know, whatever complex thing you can think of. You could even like sum up by, you know, the score of a different relevancy query, I guess. And then we have unique, which counts the number of, currently it's only string fields, counts the number of unique values in that field. So this is what uh, faceting currently looks like. You know, we get our facet.field equals cat. That's a field facet. It basically defines a bucket per unique value in the cat field, in our category field. And facet.sort equals count. That's just the default. I didn't have to specify that. Um, and so then each bucket is, you know, one bucket is electronics, and the bucket value is just the number of documents, 12. So hopefully that should all be familiar. That's the existing stuff. So when we add field facet stats, we still have our facet.field equals cat on the top. Um, but we've added facet.stat, that's a new keyword, and we're saying, you know, calculate the sum of the price fields for all the documents in every bucket. And then we're doing another one, and we're saying uh, calculate the average of the popularity field and call it pop. That's an alias. And then we're adding yet another one um, that's saying find us the number of unique manufacturers for every bucket and call it menu. And then for our sort, um, sort by pop descending. And you gotta specify an alias there. And so now this is a re new response format. So we have our cat field here again. But right away we have this stats bucket. This stats bucket represents more of a, a global. It's across all the buckets in the category field. Um, so, you know, we have, we have all the stats that we asked for, the sum of the price, um, which the, the label there was just used as the function because we didn't specify an alias. Uh, the population, uh, average popularity, and uh, number of unique manufacturers. And then we see we have a buckets list, and 
then we have uh, each bucket. And val is like, you know, the value of the cat field for uh, that bucket. So the, uh, the sort of related feature that this customer also wanted was subfacets. So what subfacets are is the ability to add another facet under any, uh, under all buckets generated by a parent facet. Um, so, for example, if we have um, our normal facet.field equals cat, that produces, remember, a bucket per unique value of the cat field. And so what we're saying now is for subfacet, subfacet.cat, that's the parent, dot field, that's the type, equals author. So that's sort of equivalent to facet.field equals author if you're doing it at the top level. But we're saying do this um, field facet on the author field for every bucket produced by um, the cat facet. And then we can add multiple. And so we're also saying, you know, let's add a query facet. And let's uh, query on from popularity 8 to 10. So we're trying to find high popularity documents and we're calling it high pop. Um, and then we're adding a subfacet under that subfacet. And we're saying, okay, um, so for under that query facet, uh, do a field facet on publisher. So essentially, you know, what this is doing is for every category, it's finding like, you know, just the highest population items and then saying, okay, you know, uh, field facet on publisher so I can find out what publishers are uh, responsible for most of these, you know, high popularity items. So um, you may have noticed that, uh, you know, we have some of this functionality already in the form of pivot faceting. Um, it's really pivot faceting are really a subset because they really just give a list of fields and it's really just field faceting and you can't have multiple uh, fields per you can't have multiple subfacets per facet. Um, so another big advantage, subfacets can have stats. And so that really adds a lot of power. Um, we can add a subfacet to any facet type now. So it's, it query, um, field range or query are the three types of facets essentially that we have. And subfacets can be of any type and we can have any number of them at any level. It's also the case that subfacets are sort of first class in the sense that they get parsed again by the normal solar faceting code, and so they can be configured um, like any other top level facet. So you can independently set the offsets, the limits, the, the statistics, the sorts um, for any subfacet. And so when we get down to it, um, we have subfacets and the facet by function stuff we get some uh, business intelligence goodness. So this is just something I made up. Um, and it's, uh, we're pretending that we're a book conglomerate and we have, uh, we have three chains. We have Amazon, um, we have Houses and Royalty, which is a fierce competitor of Barnes and Noble, and uh, Books Are Us. And so in our top graph, we wanted to split out um, revenue by genre and over time. And then the graph below that, we wanted to split out revenue over time by each chain. And then at the bottom here, we wanted to show for each genre, um, you know, find the top genres by revenue, not document count or anything. And then for each of those, find top authors and top books, again, by revenue. And then we have a bunch of other ways to like uh, filter and sort over here. So how could we implement this? So we start off with, you know, our facet equals true. And then we add facet.stat um, sum of sales. And that's basically our revenue. And that's going to act as a default for all of our facets, unless we override it. And facet.sort equals x descending. So we're going to be essentially always be finding the top things by revenue. So we start off with um, facet.range equals date. So a range facet 
on the date field. And so we give it the start and the gap, and that forms the basis for our two top charts. And so for then for the top chart, all we do is add a subfacet. So we're subfaceting on the date facet, and it's a field facet on the genre field. And so that gives us all the information we need to produce that top graph. And then for the second graph, we do the same thing, except this time we uh, facet on the, the chain field. And again, that gives us all the information needed to produce that graph. And now for the lower part, we just simply do a facet dot field on genre. That gives us the top genre sorted by um, the sum of sales descending. And then for the top authors and top um, titles, we simply do sub-facets on genre and, uh, and do field facets on those fields. And you could also see how um, you could really turn a lot of these things into links if you wanted to also, right? Um, so if you clicked on, um, like, say, George R.R. Martin, right, you could, you could see that you might want to see the revenue by chain. That, that you might want to see just revenue for George R.R. Martin. And uh, that would actually automatically happen unless you did um, filter exclusions. So for the top one, we probably would not want to narrow by George R.R. Martin because that would cut it down to just like just fantasy, I think. Uh, although it might be interesting if you had authors that, that did a, a bunch of genres, I guess. But. So for on the left-hand side, um, we did things a little bit differently in that there were two stats per uh, facet value. So uh, we broke things out by state, and then for each one of those, we have two values. So that was really just, you know, pretty simple. We just added, you know, give us the sum of the sales again, um, give us the number of unique stores, and call it uh, end stores, and then sort by uh, the revenue again. And then for chain, we sort of did the same thing, except we, we uh, sorted by the number of stores descending. Um, and then down here, when we uh, were breaking things out by number of books, this is using um, that unique, uh, that new unique function on the title field. And so we're just doing a normal facet field on chain and asking for the number of unique titles. This sort of, all this stuff uh, sort of assumes that you, you've fully de denormalized um, all the sales information. So you have things like, uh, you know, for a, for a unique sale, or at least aggregated, it's like, you know, the chain, the store, um, the book, the author, all in one document. So we're dealing with fully denormalized, essentially fully denormalized data here. Um, you could, you know, it doesn't have to be per sale, although it could. Um, but, you know, it's like, it would be, based, it would be uh, reported at the store level, we sold this much of this book, this, you know, over this amount of time. All right, um, I think we have some time left over for questions. Yes, Doug. Hey, uh, I was wondering, so I've, I've done a lot of C, C++ development, and I know that you talked a little bit about heap fragmentation, and I was wondering if you guys have done any metrics over time to see how, how the heap, the, C, the native heap is, is fragmenting or or if you've done anything to mitigate that? Of the C heap? Yeah. Um, I haven't, I haven't. Um, I am hoping, the, the things that we're trying to keep off heap are relatively big most of the time now. And like I said, for, for anything that's over 128K, we don't have to worry about the fragmentation because the operating system is handling that. And the operating system has access to its memory management unit, right? So it can like, you know, it doesn't have to worry about fragmentation. It can go like, here's the virtual memory we want, and I can take, you know, physical, uh, physical memory from here, physical memory from here, map it all together in a contiguous range, and, and we're good. Um, so it would really just be a problem if, um, it would really just be a problem if we ended up trying to allocate a lot more small objects than expected. So basically, if, if it would probably, we, we'd probably use the C heap a lot more when we had a, a small, um, index. So, you know, it's, but those aren't the situations we're normally worried about, right? It's more like, you know, the, the bigger when the index grows. So, yeah, that, that makes sense. So a lot of the, 
I guess a lot of so a lot of times in my experience with smaller like allocations, if you, you rely a lot more on the stack in the C and C plus plus. It's, it's like so much more performant than having to go out, like orders of magnitude more performant than dealing with the heap because it's just a pointer increment somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that, that goes more into the native code type of stuff um, where you can actually use a different execution model and not do one for one. For some of the things we're moving off heap, the, uh, the filters and stuff like that, we, we're not going to be able to do stack allocations of, obviously. But... But, uh, but yeah, that's one thing. If we, if we have really complicated things we want to do, um, you know, it can get a lot faster in native code, um, not just because the compiler can be a little bit better, but because you can just do things in different ways you can't do in Java, like the stack allocations. Yes? Um, is the n-cache architecture, is this sort of available so that if I want to create my own off-cache, off-heap cache, I can do so, or is it limited to only the two that you've had? Like, is it a generic interface or generic kind of thing that I can implement my own custom cache? Yes, I think um, a lot of the work we've done in Helio Search, um, yes, you would be able to use it to keep your own stuff um, off heap, I believe. The trick, the, trick is how you, the trick is how you end up freeing things. Um, you know, it's easy getting things. It's not so easy to know when you can free it. Um, so, for instance, how we handled this in, or in, in, for filters, it's differently. I, I did it differently for filters rather than field cache. For filters, um, I changed, you know, all, the changes run all the way through uh, Solar Index Searcher. And we're doing reference counting everywhere and you know, bumping reference counts is and decrementing it so we can figure out when we can actually free it, right? And the caches themselves, um, I made LRU cache. Is it fast LRU cache? I think it's fast LRU cache. That um, now is um, reference count smart. So you, know, you put something in it, it increments the reference count, you pull it out, it decrements the reference count. So we've pretty much handled all the, the uh, for the filter cache. And um, so, at the cache level, you have a solar cache now that can do reference counting. The problem is, in something like the field cache, you, 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 need, you need a scope of a request such that you know at the end of it you can free it. Um, so for example, we get a field cache element and we're using it for sorting. Well, that's Lucene code. We've passed something into Lucene um, and Lucene really doesn't tell us, and actually Lucene's calling out and getting these references to the field cache. Um, and so, you know, we've given it this object now, we've incremented the reference count, when do we get a chance to decrement it? How do we know when Lucene's done with it? Lucene's used to garbage collection, right? So it, when it's done with it, it just drops it. It doesn't, call, it doesn't call you back and say, hey, I'm done with this. That's the, that's the difficult part. Partially how I solved this was with uh, Solar's uh, request scope. Like there's a um, Solar info request. It's, it's a thread local, essentially, that gets set up per request. Um, and so some things, when you ask for a field cache thing, you're like, OK, I don't know when Lucene is actually going to be done with this. I'm just going to stick it in the request scope object. And when the request is actually done, then we can just like decrement the reference counts of anything that was um, looked up in the scope of that reference. So it's, I don't know if I did justice uh, just trying to like, spew it all like that. It might be better to look at, look at the code, or, or I should put together a wiki page on it exactly how. But it really depends on what you're trying to store off heap, I guess. Two quick, two quick questions. First is, um, is there any ongoing benefit to not caching on a filter query? You, know, you say don't ca no cache. Is there any benefit to that anymore? Uh, there's not a benefit in Helio search. We haven't touched that. Uh, um, there's a benefit in general. Sure, it's like. Uh, but I mean, for so if you have the Helio search, do you need to bother worrying about that issue? You, for to the no cache option. Yeah, I think it's still useful. I mean, sometimes, um, sometimes like you know, the no cache is useful if it's going to be a filter query that you definitely want to run in parallel with the main index, or it's going to be a filter query that's like almost never reused. And it's just extra work to cache it. 
I think those are some situations where no cash would still make sense. Um, and then the other question was, uh, does this impact the decision on whether you should use store f stored fields or dock values? It's related, it's related to doc value. So like, yeah. Um, so it's just different, right? Um, so if you have, if you're faceting or sorting on a doc values field, you, you sort of don't have to bring it into memory at all. Um, but you do still have to have some of that memory available for the operating system to cache it. So it's not completely free. Um, but you do have to think about it ahead of time, too, that, you know, I want to do all these things and, you know, just like to try it on doc values. I have not, I have not tried this versus doc values to see what the speed differences are. Um, you know, but it would, yeah, it would be interesting. It's definitely related, too, though. It's like, you know, there's, you, you, you do things one way or the other way, I think. Um, I don't think we're going to be taking doc values and uh, uninverting them or just copying them again into off-heap memory. That would be silly. Um, but I could see, if you had doc values, having support for native code, um, where, you know, it's essentially you could take this whole thing, and if we get in, if, like, you know, if it's memory mapped, we could point, pass a pointer to that into native code and still, you know, do native code operations over it, um, just like we can some of our off-heap stuff. Yes? So um, I've been experimenting with an off-heap cache for HBase, um, where we basically just put chunks of the file system data in, in, a, in an off-heap cache instead of relying on the OS page cache. And it's great that we can actually, st you can actually store a lot more off-heap, and we can actually leverage a lot more memory in the box. What we found, though, is that, um, yes, you take away all these like, larger chunks of, of, of memory, uh, which are like multi, multi megabyte segments, um, which does reduce the amount of time that is spent in GC. But what we also found is that it was not as much as we was we were hoping to, because what we end up with is still you still have thousands of, of cache keys basically that now instead of having a reference to an op just a strip of memory somewhere now actually have an offset in some some bucket that you keep off heap. So you're, and, and the, the, the garbage collection is, kind of, is still a function of the objects and the number of references that it needs to traverse instead of like, an, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship to the actual amount of memory that you have on heap because um, it, it's really a function of the, of the, of the amount of uh, objects that you need to visit in order to determine whether you can free them or not. I was wondering if you have any experience there. And, uh, so I, if, if I understand you correctly, you're basically saying the mark phase of the garbage collector should still have the same number of objects to traverse to determine liveness? Somewhat, yeah. And we, instead of having, uh, so let's say that you're caching a thousand blocks in, 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 ca in uh, on heap. Um, if you m move them off heap to some, some buffers off heap, it's great. You can actually store the data off heap. So you can store a lot more data. But you, you still have a thousand of these cache key objects that you're holding onto on heap. Yep. And instead of an object, Instead of an object, so you reduce the number of objects by half, but you still have a lot of objects. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, this does not reduce the number of objects at all. Um, well, I guess you could use it to reduce the number of objects, but that's not the important part. I guess from from what I saw with some of my limited testing, it's like there still may be the same number of objects for the garbage uh, collector to traverse, but the question is when does it have to traverse them? If we're building garbage so much uh, more slowly, or we're like bumping up against the max heap so much more slowly, that um, we never even got to a major garbage collection in my test, right? So the other point too is uh, the copy phase, right? It's like all the stuff you have on heap, you know, it's like tracing the live objects is only one part of it. The other part of it is, you know, copying everything around all the time. And, so, and doing the major, you know, uh, collections and stuff, compacting everything, and, and so that's a lot of work. So, I mean, I, I, I have not, um, I'm not a garbage collection expert. <laughs> I have not tried to separate those phases, like the mark phase and, and the collect phase and stuff. So you're right, the mark phase, I would think, would be about as slow. Um, but the compaction phases and stuff like that should be a lot faster because it's never having to move any of that memory that's off heap. And it just hopefully should have to do less mark phases, too, because it's not, 
it doesn't have to do GC as often. It makes sense that the copy phase, uh, uh, and that you're not copying all these these large chunks of memory around. That, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Uh, we run out of time. Oh yeah, we are done. It's great. Thank you, Yannick.